spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, aloha. Thank you so much for joining us here on Spotlight. I'm Yanji Denise. Uh, Ryan Kalei has the day off today, but he will be back here on Wednesday. Today, we are focusing our spotlight on the CORE program. That's a program that the city launched to try to help deal with the homeless issue that is affecting so much of our island. And to uh, lead us off today, we are joined by Emergency Services Department Director Dr. Jim Ireland, along with CORE Operations Manager Rachelle Rin. Let's bring them both and you'll have to excuse any technical difficulties. Ryan usually runs the uh, tech part of the show. Thank you both for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Ireland, I want to start with you. You've been part of this program, of course, from the beginning. How would you say things are going right now? Tell us about the fleet, the personnel, and sort of what the response has been like. You know, we started out small, really, with no budget. A um, few old ambulances that we redecaled, a few EMTs. Uh, we were able to get um, some federal funding, some city funding, uh, and now more federal funding where we've actually started aggressively hiring personnel since this year, since about February of this year, even though technically we started uh, late uh, last spring, uh, fall. Um, and things are going good, but we know there's so much opportunity to do better. And uh, there's plenty of people out there that need our help. We recognize that. I think everybody who just drives around the island recognizes that. I think we've been um, quite successful, the team in, in Chinatown, but really the goal is to extend those successes to Moiliili, to Waikiki, to Kaimaki, and really throughout the island. Um, one of the things I've learned is our homeless populations are different depending on where we are on the island. We've done outreach in, in Waianae, and the folks out there on the beach camps, a lot of them are from the west side of Oahu. So the solution for them um, is probably going to be different than people who are maybe in downtown, many of whom have only recently come to Hawaii and have a lot more mental illness in the downtown area versus like the, 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 the folks who are in Waikiki or in, in the Windward side. So I think we have to tailor solutions to the various communities. It's not one solution fits all, um, but we're off to a good start. We know there's a lot of work to do. Okay, and Rachel, tell us, uh, you know, we, we noted at the top that you run the day-to-day -day operations for the program. So take us on a typical call. I know that Dr. Ireland is saying that depending on where you are on the island, of course, the response is different. But typically, how, how, how you know, what are your resources like and what are, the, what are you responding to? Okay, so generally, um, every day our focus would be Chinatown, like Dr. Ireland said, Moiliili and Waikiki. Um, my staff will go out three times a day in the Chinatown area, once a day in Waikiki, and then Moiliili, we try to go out every uh, maybe two to three times a week. So we would um, basically offer our case management services to our participants. If they agree to participate, then what we do is we follow up with them weekly or more frequently as needed. Um, and then we also have a hotline. So the general public or other city entities can call in to request services for homeless individuals needing non-emergent medical assistance or, um, you know, HPD sometimes calls us for non-violent assistance with the homeless population. And, and if you could tell, you know, to walk us through what kind of issues they're responding to and, and, and are you okay. able to actually place these people or, or what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing? For okay. Them? So when we go out, it's um, our community health workers. So they do the social service aspect of the program. And then we have our EMTs who, of course, um, can do our basic medical assessment uh, vitals. Majority of the assessments are, or majority of the services wound care. Um, and then we also, as far as resources, as everyone knows, um, it's it, our shelters are to capacity on most days. So it, it's a challenge. It can take weeks before we can get someone into an emergency shelter. 
However, we have succeeded in at least placing 30 people since our um, start in December, and that would include um, emergency transitional uh, rapid rehousing, boarding homes, those sorts of placements. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Ireland, I'm interested to know when this program was launched, part of the idea was that it would alleviate a lot of the stress on EMS uh, to respond to more critical calls. Has that actually happened? Is this sort of lifting some of that burden? It has, but I'd like to lift even more because, you know, EMS is, is stressed as a system. Um, you know, nationwide EMS is stressed uh, post-pandemic. Um, so, you know, for instance, just you know, a half hour ago, there was a call on Hotel Street. A homeless lady didn't feel well. She walked into the police substation. They called for an ambulance. Well, you know, all the ambulances in town were already on calls and they were going to have to maybe bring in, you know, somebody as far away as Kanioi or Aya to come down to Chinatown. And it was a minor call. She didn't have any life threatening emergencies. Cora is right on Powahi Street, a block away. They were able to go over to the um, substation, assess the patient, and, and took her over to Queens. Um, they take people to all the hospitals in town um, if they need to go to the hospital. But we're also looking at taking people to potentially places that are not the ER, like the home clinic, which is the um, homeless outreach medical education clinic run by um, the medical school, Jabsung. And so we take people to their clinic and we're looking at other community health partners, um, especially the federally funded community health centers to take patients to who are homeless, who have non life threatening emergencies, such as needing medication refills, um, minor wounds that don't necessarily need debridement, uh, minor psychiatric services, because the ERs, uh, Kuakini, Straub, uh, um, Queens and town are very, very busy. And if we can take people to um, urgent cares uh, or these other community health centers, we alleviate them. Um, I just wanna circle back to one more thing just that kind of Ray, Rachelle was talking about as far as the placement. Some of the patients we've been able to place have been homeless for three, four, five, even 10 years, which is really amazing um, and sad to think that people can be homeless in our community for that long. Um, I'll just tell you one story to just give you an example. Um, um, Brooke Wilson, who was the chief of staff for the lieutenant governor, was buying vegetables in Chinatown on a Saturday, found a lady in, with no clothing, a uh, blanket around her, her, her shoulders. She was in her 70s, I believe, and in a wheelchair, unable to walk. Um, Good Samaritans would go by and give her food. And, um, and she called she called CORE and said, can you help this lady? The team went down, did a medical assessment. Um, Auntie Blanche and Waimanalo had a small house available and we had her there um, within about an hour and a half. And this is a woman who'd been on the streets in Chinatown for two and a half years. How she was overlooked all this time, how she was not able to get housing, I don't know all the backstory, but there's been some follow-up from the Lieutenant Governor's office and she's doing great. Um, so the, even though that's one success, if we can build on that and start doing that kind of on the daily basis, um, and we're going we're gonna to make a big dent in this, this issue that's not only affecting our community, but really across the country. Absolutely. And, and let's, I want to stick with you on that for just a second. This idea, you know, Rachel mentioned that there's really uh, a lack of beds uh, in the shelters. And of course, we know we need more permanent housing. Where do you see that sort of backlog, if you will? You know, we know that um, the calls, I'm sure, will come in and the resources can be deployed through CORE, but then there is this critical point, which is where to place these folks. So how do you how do you deal with that? So, you know, not to take away anything from everything that everybody's already doing, because everybody who's out there, the government, the nonprofit uh, sections, and just everybody else is doing a really, really good job. They're just maxed out. So, you know, IHS has done a, a great job in, in what they're doing. But there's just at what, some point no room at the end anymore. Um, so what we probably need is another uh, shelter um, for to, so people can go to immediately. Um, and, and that may need to be a city shelter that can take 100 to 200 people. That's one thing. Uh, the small village that we see out off Nimitz by the airport, um, the small village that uh, Auntie Blanche runs in Waimanalo, um, we probably need 10 of those all around the island with 50, 50 small villages. And so... You know, if we had a 200 bed shelter, uh, 10 of those small house villages with 50 uh, small houses each, that's 500. And then most importantly, we also need um, to partner with the state to utilize the old state hospital. Uh, you know, the state hospital where the, the mentally ill are housed, go to um, a new, they got a new building, they're, they're transitioning over to that new building, which will leave the old building um, apparently empty. 
So if we could partner with the state to use those for acute stabilization, because we know a significant number of the, um, the, the homeless population are mentally ill. Now, right now, we don't have a lot of choices. We can go Queens as an inpatient mental health unit, and so does Castle. Um, and those are our choices. And a lot of times they're full and they're not appropriate for people to stay for weeks and weeks. It's acute treatment. So once they leave the hospital, if they're not quite sick enough to go to the hospital, sometimes they're not well enough mentally to go to a shelter, or go back to the streets. So having that old state hospital or something like it is um, very important to get people stabilized before they can go into a regular shelter, or some kind of a case management um, um, facility. So, you know, those three aspects, more shelter space, small house villages, um, more mental health stabilization beds, I think is the key and, and we can get there. Um, and then, you know, long-term for the people who are homeless because of, um, you know, financial barriers, you know, that's where affordable housing and more city and state owned low-income housing really can help those folks, um, you know, get off the streets forever. But the folks with, you know, drug and alcohol dependency issues, mental health issues, they need treatment before they can get into housing and placement because um, they won't do well otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and Rachelle, tell about your resources. How many rigs do you have? How many employees do you have? And are you looking for new workers? And if so, you know, what areas are you hiring in? Okay. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we have uh, 12 community health workers, and then we have another 15 EMTs. Um, we've got two rigs or two ambulances that we use daily, and then we've got two uh, city-issued SUVs that takes the team around. Um, again, our focus is Chinatown, Mo'ili'ili, and Waikiki. Until we can expand to a much bigger team, then we will start uh, expanding to the different areas on the island of Oahu, with the goal being the entire island. And are you hiring at the moment? And if so, in what area? Okay, so basically our, our main office is in Chinatown on Powahi Street. We are hiring um, entry level, as well as people who do have experience working with the houseless population. And their, their base point at this point would be in Chinatown. And you know, Yunji, I'll just add that, you know, we have two, a psychiatrist and a family physician joining us, uh, I believe next week or the week after, as well as two RNs, I believe with a mental health backgrounds um, to, to kind of round out the medical aspect of the team. Our goal right now is about 50 people on the federal funding. Um, but we do know we want to carry this program on um, beyond the life of the federal funding. Now, the federal funding is ongoing. So that could go on for many, many years. But in the event that it doesn't, we have made some plans to ease these positions into the city budget so it can be continued. Um, and once they become into the city budget, they will be permanent civil service positions. But because right now it's federal funding, they are all contract positions um, because they're dependent on the federal funding. But the goal is um, as the program gets um, you know, more established and, and, and uh, continued you know, successfully, we would like to have these city funded. Um, maybe not all 50, but at least some. So, um, you know, we can leave our number at the end, but um, yeah, we're definitely hiring. <laughs> Let's talk about that federal funding. How big is it? And my impression, or, you know, how, what, what sum are we looking at? And my impression was that it was like pandemic funds, basically, R American Rescue Act funds. So when you say it's ongoing, is this not tied to pandemic funding? This is ongoing grants that can be renewed? Or, or tell us a little bit about the funding mechanism and how much money we're talking about. Sure. This program, uh, when I think of the pandemic funding, I think of the CARES money that was used. Uh, EMS, our department, used that money for um, ambulances, vehicles, decontamination equipment, PPE. That's CARES funding. The American Recovery Act, or FRF funding, um, is what we use to fund CORE, the, the federal funding that came kind of after the CARES Act. I think we, we got about $6.5 to get the program launched and carry it through um, the first year with personnel, equipment, um, that sort of thing. Um, the next year, we have what's called congressionally directed funding, and that was made through Senator Schatz's office, and I believe that's somewhere right around $9 million, and that will be the funding that will carry us on um, year to year as the congressionally directed funding as long as we can get that, um, but if that were to, um, were to go away at some point or be reduced, then we would transition to city funding. Okay. You know, Rachel, you mentioned those 30 people or so that have been placed. Tell us about you know, what that is, you know, for the, for the team, when you see someone like what Dr. Ireland was talking about with the woman uh, who was houseless in Chinatown for two plus years, when you see someone actually get into housing, I mean, that's what really this is all about. 
Um, you know, it, it's very, very rewarding for my staff, especially because we've got elderly, uh, like Kupuna on the street, 60, 70, 80 years old. They've been houseless for 15 plus years. Um, and so with that being said, we've had an 80 year old gentleman who was houseless in the Lanakila District Park for about 20 years. And we, you know, we tried to get him into some form of housing and he was resistant at first because he grew so acclimated to living outdoors. But we got him to agree and he's going on, I wanna say two to three months in a boarding home, very happy. Um, so it's it's rewarding for us to, you know, be out there every day offering our service. And even if at first someone is resistant or declines our service, I always tell my staff, you know, today just may not be the right day. Let's just keep going out there and offering it to them until they're open mm -hmm. for help. Yanji, doesn't that blow your mind? Somebody could live in a park for 20 years in our community and we as a community just walk by them and are helpless to do anything. And so when I'm down at core, I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of high five in the, the team and just so happy with these successes. And, you know, um, I never want this to not be exciting for us where it's routine because these are so monumentous, especially the folks who've been homeless and houseless for, you know, 10 years, five years, you know, whatever the length of time is, it's just amazing. Um, and so I took everybody out to dim sum. Uh, was that Monday, Ray? Was that when we did that last, last week? week? Yes. <laughs> um, just because they housed a bunch of people right in a row. I was super excited for them. And um, they're just doing such great work. But I, I think the public will really appreciate it more when they can see a visual difference in our beaches and our parks and can walk down a sidewalk without having to go around tents. And um, and so you can see that now in Chinatown. But but I'm 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 I'm. I'm not frustrated, but I'm I'm just eager to get the rest of the island, especially when we live in Waikiki right now, because that's our focus, looking like Chinatown. Now, Chinatown still has people who are homeless. Those are the ones that are, you know, really working hard to get housed. Um, but it's just looks so much better. It's so much safer. And that's the other thing is, is safety. People who are living and visiting Hawaii deserve to be safe at the beaches and the parks and not be accosted by people who have um, you know, decompensated mental illness or the criminality. And, you know, the police are our really good partners in this um, because if people are violent or there's criminality, um, that's where CORE steps back and we let HPD step up. You know, if it's a medical issue or a mental health issue, CORE will take the lead or EMS will take the lead. But once people you know, are swinging weapons or throwing punches or going to hurt somebody or themselves, we really depend on the police. So we are really coming at this, like, we're not going to replace the police, defund the police, any of those things that I think are so unwise that they're doing in the mainland. We want to be partners with the police. And if they're supposed to step up because it's in their real house, we'll back them up and vice versa. They always are there to back us up. So that really strong partnership of Kokua with our kind of brothers and sisters and cousins within the city, um, you know, um, employment um, has really worked well for us. You know, and I want to sort of stick on that point, this idea that we've seen, we just had our, you know, campaign season, if you will, leading up to the primary and homelessness is always at the top of the list as is affordable housing. The two, of course, go hand in hand. Uh, and over the decades, really, we have heard different, you know, ideas mentioned and different strategies, whether it was the Caldwell administration and the sweeps, uh, the Housing First initiative, and now we have CORE. Why do you think that this is a good investment and how do you think this will be different? Because I think that the public is so frustrated with what has gone on over the years. We all know this is a big problem. We have so much aloha in our heart for all of these folks. I mean, when you mentioned someone being homeless for decades living in a park, that is just, you know, very hard to think about as a community. How have we let that happen? But Dr. Ireland, why do you think that this program in particular will be different than the ones we've seen in the past? Well, you know, you're exactly right that this is a platform issue for many people running for elected office and they, they're going to take care of homelessness, houselessness, affordable housing. But I notice in many campaigns, these are ideals and abstract commitments that don't have a lot of um, details behind them. Like they don't and maybe they don't know how to do it. They want to do it. They have good intentions. Um, when our mayor was elected um, and, and I was appointed, Anton Krucki was appointed, he took talked to Anton and said, you figure this out and let's, and this is pre-core. 
So Anton made some meetings. We had six meetings. Police were there. The nonprofits were there. EMS was there. Home, houseless people were at the table. Six meetings. We came up with the concept of CORE. There's so much medical and mental health and, and substance abuse in these populations that that's why it was housed under our department rather than housing or someone else. So we're taking a medical, social work, mental health approach to these problems. I think that's going to be the key to our success. So that was the birth of CORE. But it was the mayors being newly elected and wanting to um, basically fulfill a campaign promise that was the seed for this and the energy and the new blood, so to speak, of new ideas. And that's why I'm very excited about the governor's race, because um, no matter who becomes the next governor, we will again have new energy, new ideas, new collaboration. And I think when we do have a new administration in place, not that the old administration is doing anything wrong, but you know, both the Caldwell and Ige administrations, in fairness, have done really nothing but COVID, rightly so, for the last you know two plus years. And it's really been distracting in a way from everything else that really needs to be taken care of in our community. You know, they had to make sure people had jobs, they had to get the tourists back, they had to keep people from dying. And so COVID, in fairness, took out took out the last two and a half years. COVID's almost behind us, not quite. You know, I had it last month. I think I mentioned that earlier, finally. Um, you know, let my guard down without my mask. Um, but as we get through this, we really need to go back and look at everything else that we're um, talking about that's affecting our communities that we need to get taken care of, so to speak. And so I think there's just a lot of energy. And again, attacking this from a medical mental health standpoint, um, in addition to all the other good ideas everybody else has come up with, I think is going to be is going to be successful. Yeah, Rachel, I would ask you the same question. You know, I know you've worked in this space for some time. What do you think is different about this strategy versus other tactics that have been employed in the past? Okay, I mean, for one, a lot of the nonprofit agencies that you know have contracts with CCS, MedQuest, and um, Adult Mental Health, a lot of times they're only provided a X amount of units to work with each individual patient. As for us, you know, because of our funding and we are, we fall under the city, we don't have that um, constraint. We could work with one individual for months on end until we can meet their needs. So that's one. And two, um, you know, we, like Dr. Ireland said earlier, we're able to meet the needs of medical as well as um, their psychological, mental health needs. We've got transportation being our rigs that can take them to and from their appointments or to the um, emergency room, even if they're accepted into a shelter and there's no transportation available, we're able to do that with our rigs. So there are a lot of things that we, you know, that we can do to support our partnering agencies to be successful, not only as, not only as a whole, but like I said, collaboratively with our um, community partners. You, you know, gee, some of the people that we've taken care of, especially in, in Chinatown, even in Waikiki, they call 911 every day. I mean, it's, it's amazing that, that that can happen, but we've got probably a handful, four or five people that were calling 911 every day. I, I, I made, I defecated in my pants. I ran out of medicines. My foot hurts. I'm hungry. I mean, these are all real complaints, but these are not 911 paramedic advanced life support calls that were really tying up EMS units and police units and fire department units. And so when CORE goes out there, I tell the team and Rochelle tells them the same thing. If you need to spend an hour or two with one person to get some kind of definitive care for them or get them connected with a community health center or get them connected with a shelter, you've actually saved 100 911 calls over the next year. And so just putting that extra time and an extra effort with these, sometimes we use the word high utilizers, um, saves not only a lot of resources, but every trip to the emergency room on a city ambulance um, is $1,800. And that's usually paid by Medicare or Medicaid, which are government insurance policies. Um, a trip to the ER when the physician sees you and the nurses and you get ER level of care. If you're having a heart attack, been in an accident, you know, appendicitis, by all means, you need that. But if you're just going because you've soiled yourself or you're hungry or you need some gout medication, our core teams can help with that. You know, they transport people sometimes just to the Punawai rest stop, just to shower and get hygiene and prevent a 911 call. So we, even though, you know, we're funded, we're saving the system 
um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in unnecessary medical costs. No, um, that, our that ambulance, is so important. Not only yes. carrying the medical stuff, you know, they carry diapers too and hygiene equipment, feminine hygiene equipment uh, to give people dignity that don't have, um, aren't housed yet. And, and Rachelle, you know, we're almost out of time, but I just want to ask you about the uh, experience on the other side. If, you know, if someone in our community is watching this and they see someone in their community who's homeless and who needs some help, uh, what kind of information do they need? Who do they call? Tell, tell us about sort of the logistics on that. Okay. So generally they can call our office and, um, you know, give us the location of the consumer or the patient. Let, uh, brief description and tell us what the concerns are. And then we'll we definitely send out a team of community health workers along with our EMT to assess further. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Ireland, you know, this is something that, of course, our community wants to support. You talked about some long-term needs that you have, the state hospital, more shelters. What are those conversations like right now, and how can the community best support those efforts? You know, at the city, we're having ongoing meetings about that. You know, the lieutenant governor has been very active in um, homeless advocacy. We've had some meetings with the lieutenant governor's office. Um, so I think a lot of that after kind of the election season is over here in the next just short few months, um, we'll see a lot more, um, I think, movement in those areas. But on the city side, we're already um, having those meetings regularly looking for um, places coming up with some planning. And just before we go, maybe Ren, uh, Ray could share the core number. You know, I'm embarrassed yeah. to say kind of here on the spot, I don't have it memorized, <laughs> but um, um, it's something, 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 something core, but Ray, you know that. <laughs> Okay, so it's 808-768-CORE, that's 2673. Okay. That is a number that we all need to know, and we appreciate you both being here. Just, you know, while we have you, just what are your final thoughts for the community? What do you want them to know about this program? You know, from my standpoint, um, we appreciate everybody's support. You know, we wear the characteristic red shirts. Um, the homeless actually greet us. How's it, Brada? How's it, Sista? You know, they like meeting with us. We're, they're not afraid of us. Um, from the community, we just need your patience because we're, we're getting yes. to everybody. It's just we can't get to everybody overnight. Um, but please call us if you have concerns about your neighborhood. Okay, right. and Rachel, Rachel, we'll give you the last word. Okay, yeah, like Dr. Arvind said, give us a call. We're here to help. Um, again, if you have you have a friend or a neighbor that needs assistance, don't be afraid to call us. Reach out to us. We're here if you need us, and we're available seven days a week. Okay. Okay, well, Dr. Jim Ireland and Rachel Rin, thank you both for being here this morning. We truly appreciate your time. Thanks for giving us, giving us an update on the core program, and we hope to see you both again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Mahalo. Well, great to have both of them on today and to get that update on the core program. A lot of federal resources being put into this program. Uh, as they mentioned, they are hoping to staff up to about 50 people. They have two uh, ambulances, converted ambulances, so-called rigs, that they are using to dispatch to teams. They're focused Chinatown, uh, the downtown area, Waikiki and Mo'ili'ili, hoping to expand to other areas of the city and county of Honolulu so that, you know, we, we know we see homeless folks all over the island. And of course, they all deserve and need some help. The challenge that they say is not necessarily responding to the calls themselves, but sort of the page two, where do those folks go? Uh, Dr. Ireland saying that he thinks that, you know, hopefully he would like to see the city perhaps open a shelter and also use the old state hospital for acute mental health care. We know that the new state hospital, people are being transferred over there. So there will be this facility that could perhaps be available with the right resources. Um, you know, it all comes down to resources and that's really the challenge there. But good to hear about the successes they've had so far uh, since opening in the last, you know, over the last year probably about December is when they really got up and running. Since then, they've been able to place over 30 people into more permanent situations. If you think about what Dr. Ireland was saying, you know, $1,800 every 911 call, he's saying that if you invest that time and money into those individuals, you could save 100 911 calls just for one person and on and on, not to mention, of course, the most important thing, which is the dignity of these folks and giving them a better life. So we really appreciate uh, their input today. They're hoping for good things after the election when the focus uh, really you know, kicks off onto this issue. So we appreciate their time and all of their efforts. And of course, uh, if you see something in your community, make sure that you call that number and try to get folks resources. On Wednesday, 
Ryan will be back and we'll be switching the focus to UH and athletics. Uh, athletics director Dave Matlin is going to be here along with coach Timmy Chang. We know that football season is upon us and we are looking forward to the new things that the coach is bringing. Uh, there's been a lot of write-ups in the paper. Of course, also we'll be talking about the stadium and uh, what their input is on plans for that and what athletics is going to look like over the next season. So we appreciate them joining us and we appreciate you joining us today. We'll see you right back here on Wednesday on Spotlight Hawaii. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long Strugs.